say hello and welcome to everybody. Uh, this is Martin for the Aviation's UK Tax Week, and thank you so, so, so much for joining us. Um, I hope you have enjoyed the bite-sized webinars that we have put on this week. We had basic customs and VAT rules. We looked at special customs procedures, so temporary admission, customs warehouse, and inward processing relief. We looked at some common misconceptions, and then in the final bite-sized webinar, we looked at opportunities and challenges facing business aviation from different industry perspectives. So today I am joined by Greta Kemper and Adrian Jones, our very own specialist tax advisors, and we're going to have a live interactive audience led webinar. Very excited about that. We want to make it as interactive as possible. So please, 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 please ask questions. You will see there is a Q&A box down at the bottom of your screen. If you click on that, you'll be able to write some questions. Alternatively, if you want to raise your hand, I can let you answer those questions uh, in person through the audio. If you are writing in the um, Q&A box, you can vote those questions. If you see ones that you like, you can vote that up by clicking at the thumbs up button. You can also choose to write those anonymously if you should wish so. When we are answering a question from the Q&A box, you will see that that is being answered live. And after it has been answered, it will say that it has been answered. Now, the questions that Adrian and Greta are asking, as I'm saying several times, this is live, so please don't include uh, too much client information and make those confidential. Um, similarly, the information that Greta and Adrian will be providing is not client specific, it is at a high level, so it shouldn't be treated as formal tax advice. Of course, if you would like formal tax advice, Greta and Adrian will be available after this webinar. We are going to have some polls. We've also got a survey at the end of the webinar. It's really important that you um, provide us with some information because it helps us get better and improve our webinar series for you. Now, um, we're going to try and answer as many questions <coughs> as possible during this session. And um, if we can't pick them up during the session we will do so afterwards but we're going to give about 45 minutes see where we get to now to get the ball rolling i have some questions that have already been emailed into us by some attendees so adrian if i can start with the first question that we've had in through the email it is are there any documents that should be kept on, on board an aircraft to evidence uh, operations under temporary admission Okay, so um, temporary admission is um, a means of an aircraft arriving into a customs territory, um, be it the EU, UK, perhaps. And the three core requirements, I guess, for temporary admission are registration, ownership, and user. So um, the registration should be apparent from the, the tail number, but um, the registration document would certainly show that the registration is outside that customs territory, which is the first tenant. Um, the second is that the legal ownership, the, the name in, in, in which the registration is placed, is also outside of the customs territory. So that would be the registration document again, I guess. So very useful to have that on board. In terms of the user, the user of the aircraft needs to be established resident outside of that customs territory. So in that sense, um, a passport is, is indicative of where the person sat at the back of the aircraft might be resident, but citizenship is, is, is not the test, it's residence. So if the passport isn't outside of that customs territory, then perhaps some paperwork to show that an individual's residence is clearly outside of that customs territory. And then you have the three, um, three sort of basic criteria for temporary admission covered. So registration document, 
um, proof of residence for the, the user of the aircraft. Thank you, Adrian. Um, come on, we want some questions. Get, get, get Adrian and Greta on their toes. While we're waiting for those to come in, I'm going to launch our poll. So please do participate in that. Greta, another one from the emails. Uh, my aircraft is in the USA for sale. It was imported into the Isle of Man. Do I need to export it? And if so, how do I do this? Okay, well, what you would normally say is that it's always important to get a paper trail in place, if at all possible. If you are planning to remove your aircraft to the US for sale, for sale rather, um, then you should formally export the aircraft. You can always bring it back under, for example, the return goods relief if the sale doesn't go ahead. If the aircraft has already arrived in the US, there is a, a such a thing known as deemed export. If, if the aircraft is then sold, it will lose its um, UK free circulation. So um, effectively the deemed export will crystallize into a formal export, but you will still need to prove to Isle of Man Customs or HMRC that the aircraft has gone, and therefore you would want to pull together um, a bundle of documentation to evidence flight logs, evidence of the sale, etc. It is always better to have an export document if you can get it. It is possible to retrospectively export the aircraft, but not particularly easy. Thank you. Great. Okay, so we're finally getting some, some questions in. Um, so, Adrian, I'm an AOC operator. Do I have to import the aircraft if the VAT is 0% anyway? Um, I think the answer is yes, if the AOC operation um, requires charter within um, a specific customs territory. Certainly for the UK and the EU, if you travel within the UK um, as a separate customs territory now between London, Edinburgh, as a charter flight, then I think the, the you would definitely have to import into the UK. And likewise in the EU, if you're traveling between EU countries or within EU countries, then that aircraft should be imported. And that, that's a separate and distinct um, consideration to um, flying rights um, from the local civil aviation authority for permission to charter or, or, or similar. Custom status is important. If you're going to operate as a charter aircraft within a customs territory, then yes, you, you should still be imported. The fact that VAT is at 0%, well, um, that just makes it easier, really. Um, Great, thank you, Adrian. I can see lots of people are participating in the poll. Thank you very much. Um, so we have, Getting lots of questions in now. Let's turn to Greta. Um, I'm buying a new aircraft and it's being based in the UK. Do I need to import if the client is an American and it's November registered? Okay, the import question is really separate to where the client is resident or established and the aircraft registration unless you're looking at using temporary admission. So you have to consider what is gonna be the use of the aircraft in the territory? Is it gonna be used on a regular basis there? All those sorts of questions. Um, it's possible you might be able to use temporary admission if the main user is American and the aircraft is then registered and it meets all the other temporary admission conditions. Great, thank you, Greta. So, um, Adrian, another one from the emails, just going back to exports. Uh, what about if you're VAT registered in the UK or the EU? Do you need a formal export declaration? If the owning company has imported the aircraft, is that registered, um, carrying out business activities, and the aircraft is sold for export, then yes, you need definitely need um, an export declaration. Um, the 
the, 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 the finesse there might be that the aircraft could have been removed um, uh, several months before, perhaps, to the US and is then just sold whilst it's sitting in the US, um, in which case, arguably, it's, it's been removed. There's been a deemed export on removal to the US. And no export declaration is required at that point. But, but you should assume that in the ordinary course of a sale for export, then yes, an export declaration would be required. Thank you, Adrian. Uh, it would appear that our attendees have now worked out how to use the upvoting buttons. This is fantastic. So uh, we have our first named um, question. So Simon Mitchell is asking, I understand that transit and transition status still apply to aircraft that are currently one side of the E line or the other. Has this been tested yet? And is there any indication of how long this period will be considered relevant? Adrian, my gut feeling is that is your area. Um, yes. And I think that the first thing to say here is that this is largely uncharted territory. I mean, as everyone knows, this is the first time that a new member state has left the EU. So quite what might happen in the future um, is a little unclear. Um, I think that it's safe to say that the transitional status arrangements have to some extent been tested because we've not heard of lots of aircraft that have been somehow detained or VAT charged whilst in transition. But that's not to say that EU member states are completely clear about what to do and how to treat these aircraft at present. Um, so tested to some extent, but not rigorously. How long the period will be considered relevant? Well, a lot of this area is subject to, if you like, temporal effect. As time goes by, there'll be less recollection of what these arrangements were and um, how robust they are, I think will diminish with time. Um, it will move from something which is more concrete now perhaps to something which sounds vaguely like an excuse to any local inspecting customs officer who doesn't quite fully understand the background anymore for why we've got to where we've got. The other consideration is that the, there's, there's no um, real supranational control between the UK and the EU to govern these arrangements. There are committee structures which are beginning to be set up that should look at some of these areas, but this is a minor area compared to some of the other um, bigger trading issues that have developed with the separation of the two customs territories. And I fear that consideration of these transition status, transitional arrangements um, may not get as much early attention in those committees as perhaps any of us would like. So I would err on the side of caution. Um, yes, currently I'd say they're good, um, but if a more definitive, um, perhaps re-imported solution can be found for those assets, uh, that would perhaps prove a more enduring and um, in the long term, less risky approach. Thank you, Adrian. Um, <coughs> Simon, I hope that has answered your question. So, Greta, um, should I use a limited partnership to own my aircraft in the UK, I've been advised to do so. Okay, I think this is probably more of a benefit in kind question. Um, so I, I think that's probably something that we should pick up separately. But that that's, I imagine what your advisor is, is the reason why your advisor is recommending that. It's about the fact that the UBO or shareholders, whoever, are actually getting use of a business asset. Thank you, Greta. So, attendees, please do keep asking questions. This is what is going to um, put Greta and Adrian on their toes. So, Adrian, as a UK entity closing on the purchase of an aircraft in the EU, 
flying the aircraft out of the EU post-sale, should I be concerned about EU VAT? Yes. Um, the, the short answer is yes. If you're closing on a purchase and the aircraft is located in the EU, then the initial um, view is that just because of the location of the aircraft, that sale is subject to EU VAT. Now, that means you're caught with it by EU VAT law. And yes, if you export an aircraft, that export should be uh, zero rated exempt in EU terms from VAT. But there may be, a, there, there will be other conditions that you have to meet. Yes, the aircraft has to be part, but um, the exporter has to keep evidence of that departure. Um, there are certain conditions which you might want to see in contract to make sure that the exporter, in keeping those export uh, proofs, um, is complying with local VAT export requirements. Because if the supplier doesn't comply with the export requirements, the, the purchase agreement probably puts that tax risk on the buyer. So there, there needs to be some consideration to how the parties are going to make sure that the aircraft is, um, at the aircraft sale is properly treated for VAT purposes and exempted or zero rated. Um, so, and, and not least, of course, there should be an export declaration made as well. Um, for customs compliance purposes. Thank you, Adrian. Fantastic, we have another in-person question. Uh, thank you very much, Sean. So Sean is asking, it's a bit of a long one. So um, Greta, I'm gonna to turn to you on this one initially anyway. If I am a UK resident with international business, can I use one of my US businesses to purchase, and purchase the aircraft and avail of bonus depreciation? Note that only 25% of the year the aircraft will physically be in the US and 75% in the UK or EU. Any issue on the temporary admission to the UK and EU? Okay, I think there's actually a bundle of questions in here. <laughs> um, thinking about which entity you use to purchase an aircraft, um, you do need to think about import VAT, for example. The UK has recently changed their rules. Well, they claim they haven't, but in reality, we think they have, um, to say that only an owner of an aircraft can reclaim import VAT. And obviously, in order to do that, you need to have an establishment either in the UK mainland or on the Isle of Man in order to get VAT registration, in order to reclaim that import VAT. So you do need to think quite carefully about which entity purchases the aircraft if you're going to need to import. Now, I read from your question that you're talking about temporary admission. Um, temporary admission, one of the rules for temporary admission is about the time. It's intended, obviously, for temporary use. The idea of temporary admission is not to permit people who are actually really going to be established or have the aircraft used consistently in the territory because then you're competing with already imported aircraft that have paid the import VAT or locally manufactured aircraft equally which have paid VAT. Um, so if you're talking about, so I'm just reading this, the aircraft will physically be in the US 25% of the time and 75% in the UK. <clears throat> Obviously one of the conditions for temporary admission is, is the six month um, discharge period. If the aircraft is here for longer than six months, or if it's formally, for example, based here, you may struggle to use temporary admission. Thank you, Greta. And oh, Adrian, you've got some extra. I was, I was going to add that um, in terms of temporary admission, it's become somewhat easier if you're looking at a UK and EU based aircraft, an aircraft that works between the two customs territories, because you have six months of temporary admission in the UK and six months in the EU. So at any particular time, the aircraft can be moving between the UK and the EU 
and that should restart the clock for temporary admission. So it makes it makes temporary admission easier for an aircraft which is used routinely between the EU and the UK. Um, in terms of bonus depreciation, um, I don't know if that's a, a question for us. Bonus depreciation is a very American um, tax concept and we don't advise on US tax, but we do know people who can. So um, happy to um, put you in touch with someone there if you need. In fact, I, I can see a couple on this call um, that, that would be able to, to answer that as well. So thank you, Sean. I hope that has answered your question. Please do keep them coming in. Um, so where have we got to? So um, Adrian, maybe this one is for you. My client has been flying into the UK for years, has not had to show any paperwork. Why should I import it now? Um, yeah, I, I think it's fair to say that customs authorities and um, certainly in the UK, um, the, uh, the, the staff members available to carry out inspections, um, the border force um, deployment at local airport, air, airports uh, has declined over the years. Um, I was a customs officer for 10 years and even in that, those 10 years, they were continuously reviewing um, resourcing and the available staff to do whatever tasks that we were given um, by the government at the time. And my feeling is that, yes, there will be many aircraft that aren't imported, but that should be. And um, the, the, the fact that there, there hasn't been an inspection of the aircraft doesn't mean that there won't be, and that if the aircraft is found lacking, um, the danger is that you not only suffer the VAT at import because customs require it, but there's also a penalty applied, which um, can be a percentage of the tax due. So um, my recommendation is always to um, comply with the relevant um, tax law, not to pay more than you should, but certainly to um, be compliant with the rules. Um, I, I think even for tax, ignorance isn't a defense. So, um, yeah, I, I, I would recommend input if that is what should be done. Thank you, Adrian. Uh, reminder to our audience, you can, of course, ask questions in person. If you want to, just raise your hand and I will uh, activate your audio. So, Greta, um, this one is getting lots of votes. It's a bit of a long one. If an EU27 owner has had a UK operator for their aircraft and it was zero rated for VAT on the basis of its commercial use, and now the UK operator can no longer operate commercially within the EU27. Does the VAT and import status within the EU currently stand, still stand, despite it now being operated on part NCC or privately? So it's a bit of flight ops there, but effectively, will its status change because it's moved from commercial to private? Okay, I, th I think this is. Um... This is obviously partly to do with the Brexit scenario. So an aircraft has been EU imported pre-Brexit, so to speak. Originally, it would have had access to both territories. But now that the territory is split in two, at least from our perspective, um, you're not going to be able to retain free circulation in both. I think that's the first part of the question. Does the VAT import status within the EU 27 still stand? We would say no, probably not. Um, we would um, feel that it would be a serious risk to try and act as if it did. Um, if the aircraft is now being operated as non-commercial, i.e. privately, it may well be um, that you're able to use temporary admission in the EU 27, but obviously you would need to look at all the usual temporary admission conditions and confirm that it still works on that basis. Thank you, Adrian. Yeah, just a, just a quick word on that. that. That's an interesting question in the sense that the aircraft was imported um, at zero rate 
the VAT, presumably through the UK. And not only has that aircraft now lost its access to the old customs territory, i.e. Brexit presupposes that there will be a binary choice either if it, it remains imported in the UK or the EU, but, but not both. But where the zero rate has been applied and now it's moved to private use, um, I think the, the areas to look at there are um, the UK has something called a capital goods scheme, um, which looks at um, changes of status um, of aircraft to private use um, from business use. So that might be in point in this case. But interestingly, I think there's a lot of defense there as well, where you zero rated and because of charter and now you can no longer operate the charter. Um, I think you, in that case, you've been frustrated by external input. External events have forced your hand to change from that commercial use to private use. And there are certainly um, older VAT places, I remember. Um, there's, there's one about a coal mining activity that was forced to close. And it was through no fault of their own. I think the case was, was again coal. Um, and that's a legitimate defense against the need to um, repay or pay VAT, I would say, in those circumstances. A bit involved, but um, certainly um, I'd be happy to have a, a conversation about that afterwards um, if, uh, if uh, that inquiry wish. Thank you, Adrian. I hope that has answered your question. Um, so, Adrian, sticking with you, um, perhaps a, a bit of a, an edgy one, maybe, I'm not sure. My client doesn't want to pay VAT, that's always a good start, when he buys his next aircraft. Is there a standard way to eliminate the VAT on business aircraft in the UK? Shouldn't my client just put it on an AOC as he can fly as he wants? Um, Adrian, how would, you, how would you approach this question? Well, I think the first thing to say is that VAT is a business tax. And um, if you draw the comparison, say, between aircraft and yachts, we talk about business jets and pleasure yachts. So you, you can immediately see that there is a, a business nexus quite often with the purchase of a business jet. And therefore, if the aircraft is used in business in some way, that suggests that there can certainly be um, a VAT efficiency or VAT recovery for business activity, whether that's the business of an individual or the business of a corporate. Um, and that VAT efficiency and that recovery, perhaps an import or a purchase, that can apply without the need to put the aircraft onto an AOC for charter use. Now, charter use is all very well, but there are certain restrictions when the aircraft is put for charter use. Yes, the owner can charter the aircraft alongside other third party users, but HMRC take a very pragmatic view here and they say, well, if an aircraft is put to charter, then it, 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 it should be entirely a charter. And the, the ultimate owners need to charter the aircraft much like anyone else without any preference. Now, that approach might suit some owners, but I think the difficulty here is, is trying to put an aircraft owner into um, a position where the aircraft is used, not in a way that they are content with, because if you, if you put a round peg into a square hole like that, um, that will, um, ultimately lead to tensions and um, perhaps frustration of the, um, the, the AOC use as planned. Um, so th there are options and I think it's the, the message here is to build something around what the client genuinely wishes to happen um, rather than let the tax um, drive the ownership or, 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 or set up the aircraft. Thank you, Adrian. I hope that has answered that question for you. 
Um, great. I keep I keep coming to you with the multiple question um, questions. So um, one of our attendees, I have an Isle of Man registered aircraft, the BVI owning company, it's a little bit specific here, imported into the EU 10 years ago, located in Germany on the Brexit day. Has it lost its EU status is the first question. And the second question is, if it has, what do I need to put in place for a trip UK to Italy at the end of the month? I've been told I can use temporary admission. So, so it sounds like uh, they're needing advice quite quickly anyway for the, God, I'm jealous of a, a trip to Italy. But, um, but let's start with the first, uh, first question first. Has it lost its, um, its EU status? I think probably the answer to that is not necessarily. Where aircraft have been imported pre-Brexit into the EU, <clears throat> obviously now we have two territories left. Um, I think what you need to do is look at, for example, where it was imported via for the first place. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and secondly, you need to think about where am I using the aircraft? Is it primarily in the EU? Is it in the UK? Which territory do I want to retain free circulation? And then you need to look at, am I able to do that? Um, okay, if it was in Germany at Brexit day, so to speak, um, that, that's fine in terms of looking at issues like return goods relief, but you want to consider, is it really an EU imported aircraft? Do you have the documentation, for example, if it was imported by an EU member? member state, can it retain EU free circulation anyway, or are there other reasons why you might want to look at retaining UK free circulation? Um, so in terms of the trip to UK, Italy, clearly you need to ask the free answer the free circulation status question first, and I think we need a little bit more detail to do so. It's possible you might be able to use temporary admission if it's registered, if the aircraft is registered outside the EU, and it's registered in the name of an entity that's outside the EU. Of course, allowing for the fact that the aircraft will still need to meet all of the other temporary admission questions or requirements. Thank you very much, Greta. Um, our attendees, please do participate in the poll. At the moment, um, it would feel that the general consensus is that uh, the new UK tax territory has had a detrimental effect on business aviation. If you would like to change that um, to, to seeing benefits or you think it's indifferent, please do participate in the poll. Um, so going back to the questions, please do keep asking questions. Um, that keeps this webinar going. Adrian, um, something that... Uh, I think we've discussed multiple times in the last nine months. Uh, why is RGR, uh, Return Goods Relief, so confusing? Um, they say that there's different advisors giving conflicting information. Can it be used multiple times? Where would you start with that, Adrian? Um, okay, so I'm not aware of any tax code, um, particularly in the I guess the Western world that isn't confusing to some extent. I mean, tax just is, it's complicated. Um, it frustrates the hell out of me sometimes. Um, and it's my life. Um, confusing. I mean, it, I, I think that the, the, the gap in, in some people's knowledge with RGR, which is, which means return goods relief is that whenever aircraft fly out of UK customs territory or EU customs territory, they're effectively exported. It's a, a de facto export, if you like. And when they fly back in, they're de facto imported again. And you then have the question, well, when aircraft return and they should be imported, well, presumably VAT should be paid and it, 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 it's a cost and you need to make another import declaration. But in fact, where you have goods which were previously imported and then returned to the customs territory concerned, you can apply 
return of goods rule, which is, as it suggests, a relief for those goods returning to the customs territory, which allows those goods not to be imported and for no extra VAT to be paid, provided it's the same um, keeper or owner of the aircraft returning it as took it out. Now, once you've got that in mind, you start to think, well, how does that apply to Brexit and the creation of these customs territories? Um, can you apply that return goods relief principle to the UK? Um, can, you reply, can you apply it as well to the EU at the same time? Does that work? Um, is this a clever way of carrying on as if nothing has happened? Um, and I think there's a danger of assuming that somehow aircraft can continue as if nothing has happened. Um, and I think we, we, we go back to my comments earlier, the, the, the choices of binary um, following the separation of the UK EU customs territories. An asset realistically needs to be considered as imported into one of those, but not both anymore. And I don't think return goods relief should be seen as some kind of panacea to allow for the continued operation of the aircraft in both territories. Um, but certainly it's a mechanism that does allow the return of the aircraft to, if you like, its own um, customs territory, um, for want of a better description. Um, as something this confusing, um, I think I'm going to stop now. Um, but if there are any specific concerns about RGR and its application, then um, I'm happy to consider them afterwards. Thank you very much, Adrian. So, Greta, finally a short one for you. Um, how long does an aircraft have to be in the UK before it needs to be imported? Okay. Um, when the aircraft crosses the border, <clears throat> into, excuse me, into the UK, as Adrian said, there is a binary choice. You either have to import it or it has to be brought in under temporary admission. Clearly, the decision as to which you're going to use needs to be made before you cross the border. Um, if the aircraft has come in, I suppose, under something like, into one of the customs relief procedures, like um, customs warehouse or inward processing, then it can sit in that procedure and then you can decide where, when to import it at that point, whether to import it at that point. Um, but other than that, there isn't really a time scale. As it crosses the border, you need to import or use temporary admission. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Greta. Um, please do keep asking questions. Uh, and thank you for the ones that have been asked so far. Of course, you can ask in person if you would like to just raise your hand. More than happy to, to have people ask in person. So, um, Adrian, my client has bought an aircraft in the UK. He is UK resident. We just flew it in. How long is he allowed to have it here before he imports it? Okay, well... One of the criteria for temporary admission, the, the non-importation route, is that the user of the aircraft shouldn't be resident in the customs territory concerned. So where you have an aircraft arriving in the UK, a UK resident user, um, then temporary admission cannot apply. So the importation uh, should be effected um, as soon as possible after arriving. Um, there may be a tolerance just administratively to um, get organized, appoint somebody to um, declare an import, um, but uh, it's, it, in theory, there's no empty space out there for the aircraft just to hang around for a little while pending import. Um, it, it has to be somehow subject to customs control um, and in this case, import them as soon as possible. Thank you very much, Adrian. So, um, Dave, Dave has asked a question. Uh, Greta, we're coming to you with this one. So, my client has a Manx registered aircraft, it's based outside of Europe. 
We've been told that temporary import is not available in the UK. Is this correct? Okay, yes, is the short answer to that. The rules about temporary admission require an aircraft that is registered outside of the territory. If the aircraft is registered in the Isle of Man is an M registered aircraft, then that breaches that requirement for UK temporary admission. You would need to look at a registration that is either not G for the UK mainland or M for Isle of Man. Perfect, Dave. I hope that answered your question, short and sweet. Greta, uh, we've got one that's been around for a while. I think it's probably a short answer, but um, can I get secure temporary admission in the UK? I've heard that it's available in the EU. Okay, um, this phrase secure temporary admission, it's, it's not something that's in the legislation anywhere or the guidance, either the UK or frankly in the EU legislation or guidance either. Um, this is temporary admission effectively operates on the basis that you meet the conditions each time that you use temporary admission. There, there is no sort of guaranteed, oh, well, I've, I've got a piece of paper now I can permanently use temporary admission. So um, whether this, this has somehow been operating in the EU, I don't know, but certainly it's not, um, it's not something that operates in the UK. Thank you very much. Greta, Adrian, um, the Isle of Man is often talked about when the U UK VAT is mentioned. I don't understand the link between the UK and the Isle of Man. Apart from this webinar, of course, where I'm in the Isle of Man and you both are in the UK. But from a tax perspective, if you could answer. Um, that's very simple. The, the Isle of Man is part of uh, UK that territory it, it's a, a supply i think the legislation refers to a supply to or from the Isle of man as being effectively a supply to or from the, you know as if it were a supply to or from the uk it, it's a it's a um, one back territory if you like they're treated the same so um if you that, that i mean that means that if you import into the isle of man you are Importing into the UK and Isle of Man. If you import into uh, the Isle of Man an account for VAT in the Isle of Man, then that's the VAT accounted for for the UK as well, and vice versa. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Adrian. So we have two questions and we are approaching the 45 minute mark. So let's get these questions answered um, so everybody can go and enjoy their lunches. Uh, Greta, I am wanting to visit the European U Union using temporary admission. Am I able to carry EU passengers? Okay, one of the conditions for temporary admission is that it focuses on the user. And the key user is, is usually the person that effectively sits on the back of the aircraft and directs where it's going to fly to. Um, the user, same as the registration and the ownership, needs to be a non-local resident. This is not designed, temporary admission is not designed to allow local residents to fly around an aircraft that, in, in an aircraft that hasn't been imported. Um, it is possible to carry EU passengers, for example, if the main user who is not locally EU resident is on board. It is also possible in very, very restrictive circumstances, for example, where there's an EU employee of a non-EU um, user stroke company um, who is on board the aircraft for their business purposes and can show that they're an employee and are therefore flying as an employee of the non-EU business. Um, but they are very specific. Thank you very much, Greta. Uh, so we have a, a comment from uh, one of our colleagues um, on that, noting that Isle of Man VAT registrations start with the GB country code. So thank you for that, Angie. Um, Adrian, let's make this our last question of the, of the webinar. We are based in the USA and imported the client's aircraft in 2018 into the Isle of Man. Do we need to re-import the aircraft into the EU and the UK again? 
um, I think in that, that case, I would suggest um, a bit of an analysis of the, of the facts and what the, uh, the owner wants to achieve with the aircraft going forward, where the aircraft flies, um, whether it has a more EU or UK centric flight pattern. But just on the face of it, um, if the import paperwork is for the um, Isle of Man, the UK Isle of Man, um, then I would think that if there were a binary choice, perhaps you would look at considering the aircraft as remaining domestic goods imported in the UK Isle of Man, and then perhaps requiring re-importation into the EU. Um, that might be the way to look at that. But it might require a more detailed analysis of the, the circumstances and the fact pattern behind that scenario. Great, thank you, Adrian. We have a final question here. Uh, Adrian, I know you made a comment on this on the uh, on the first webinar, the bite size webinar that we did on um, basic customs and VAT rules in the new UK territory. But uh, the question is asking, are there any unique benefits to importing in the Isle of Man as opposed to the UK? Um, other than referring somebody back to that webinar, do you want to make any quick comments before we finish? I think the, the, the unique benefit of the Isle of Man, I guess, is that there are self-governing um, jurisdiction within UK back territory. So as a customs department, they're very approachable. So if you have um, a, a business plan for a business aircraft, and you're looking to um, secure a VAT registration, for example, then there can be um, a much more easy dialogue with the smaller government department there as to the bona fides of that um, business aircraft's business and justification for a VAT registration. Um, conversely, in the UK, it's a very large government department. Um, much these days is decided by computer without any reference to the underlying business. Um, and it can be a much more frustrating process to discuss any um, uh, business that might uh, be carried out by a business aircraft. Um, I think HMRC's approach is, is somewhat more distrustful um, in that regard. Perfect. Well, thank you very much, Adrian. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. I'm just going to end the poll now, share those results with you. Um, it, it would feel that we're all slightly negative um, about the new UK tax territory, not thinking it's had the beneficial impact on business aviation as one would have hoped. Um, so that really leaves me to say thank you so much for everybody that has joined today. Um, if you have any questions that you'd like to ask us offline, please do contact us. Um, all of our contact details are available on our website, martinfiddler.aero. All of the Bite Size webinars have been sent, you've been sent the links so far this week, and they are available on our website, as will this uh, live Q&A session um, after this. When you finish today, you will receive a link to a survey. Please do complete this. It helps us get better and better each time. Um, and that just leaves me to say thank you, Greta, thank you, Adrian, thank you, everybody in our audience. And we really, really hope to see you soon, whether it be in person or on another webinar. Thank you very, very much. Bye bye.